This is America on the Road, winner of the International Automotive Media Conference Gold Medal Award for Radio and now in its 24th year on the air. Thanks for being with us as we bring you the latest automotive information from around the world. And we've got some interesting stuff for you this time around. Uh, if you insure your car, as I'm sure you do, we've got a lot of information for you. America on the Road is brought to you by DrivingToday.com and the Coalition for Vehicle Choice. I'm Jack Nerad. With me is uh, guest host Gino Effler. Gino is the Director of Corporate Communications at J.D. Power, an old friend and a very knowledgeable guy. He has guest hosted on the show before. Gino, thanks so much for being with us. We appreciate it. I'm, I'm proud to be here, Jack. And gee, you, you called me a very knowledgeable guy. I, that's, that's the greatest introduction I've ever had. Thank you. Especially from me. Uh, <laughs> typically, I'm not so nice, but uh, I'll try to be nice uh, during this hour of America on the Road. Our special guest is a real treat, I think, for everybody who is going to be listening to this show. He is an author and auto journalist. Ted West is his name. We're going to be talking about his new book, Closing Speed. The book is a behind-the-scenes look at what many of us believe was the most dramatic racing series ever. That was the World Sports Car Championship along around 1970 or so, pitted Porsche 917s versus Ferrari 512s. Just an amazing uh, series that Ted was up close and personal with and has written this book now, uh, I guess that's a lot of years later, right? Uh, what is that? It's a long, long time, but man, that sounds exciting. What a, what a what a series! Yeah, super series. Uh, so uh, I mean, death was around every corner uh, in those years. In the car review segment, I'll be reviewing the latest uh, version of the most popular vehicle in America. We're talking about the 2021 Ford F-150 pickup. And having Gino along, he's going to give us uh, the JD Power Voice of the Customer view of the full size pickup truck segment. Uh, you've got a lot of information for us, don't you, Gino? I do indeed. So I'm anxious to share it. Yeah. Interesting stuff. And of course, the conduit of consumer opinion uh, is what one of the things J.D. Power is well known for. So we're, we're pleased to have Gino with us. Let's go to the news, shall we? Uh, I've got a list from our friends at Mercury Insurance. Uh, they're one of the leading auto insurers across the country. Um, and they have a list of the most affordable to insure vehicles in various types uh, and it's pretty interesting. So uh, among, I'll, I'll just give you one of the lists. And uh, there's some <laughs> really non-intuitive choices on this list. But uh, this is a list of coupes, convertibles, and sedans. And the most affordable to insure is a tie between the Chevrolet Spark and the Chevrolet Sonic. And number three, you would never guess. Uh, it is the Fiat 124. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, a two-seat sports car that's, you know, much like the uh, Mazda Miata. Uh, Honda Fit is next on the list. And then some more logical choices, I think, or more intuitive choices. The Hyundai Elantra, the Hyundai Veloster, the Volkswagen Golf, the Buick Regal, the Toyota Yaris, and the Toyota Prius. That's an impressive list. Impressive, you know, hey, if it's affordable, that's a good thing, isn't it? Right. Well, affordable, and I think as, you, as you'll as you note by looking at these vehicles, these are affordable vehicles to buy. Most of them are very affordable. Uh, and that gives you a, a little leg up in terms of affordability from an insurance standpoint. Number one, if you have to replace the car, it's a, a lot easier for the uh, insurance company, a lot cheaper for the insurance company to replace a $20,000 car than it is a $50,000 car. So you can kind of get that. But uh, I think fairly interesting stuff from uh, Mercury Insurance. And Really, you should, and I think you would endorse this view too, Gino, it is wise to look at insurance costs before you go out and buy a car, right? Absolutely. It's uh, uh, because of the, the, the area where you live plays a part, uh, you know, your age plays a part. But yeah, it's very important to, to look at every different kind of car and see what the insurance costs are going to be. It, it's like part of that overall cost of ownership you know it contributes to that very much so yeah very very important so check that out well uh, going along on the news the the 2021 toyota mirai their fuel cell vehicle is about to go on sale it'll go on sale in december this is the next generation of the uh and second generation of the mirai you know there's a lot of talk about evs 
Uh, fuel cell vehicles are essentially EVs, but, but they don't use batteries, right? So, uh, mm-hmm. you know, you know, what's your take on the Mirai uh, versus uh, other vehicles that are coming down the road here? You know, Jack, it's it seems to have been flying under the radar for a very, very long time. I, I, I mean, if you're in the car industry, you you are familiar with that car, but I don't think most consumers are very familiar with it. I'm not sure that they've really put a lot of marketing dollars behind it. You know, it's kind of, to me, it's a somewhat of a nondescript vehicle, but I've not, I can, I'll be honest and say I haven't driven one, but you know, when I see, when I see them, when I read about them, it's like, oh, okay. It might be kind of interesting, but I, I don't know if the, the manufacturer has put, a lot of marketing dollars behind behind that vehicle. Yeah, and I think probably very rightly so, and I think you analyzed it quite well. I think the first edition of the Mirai, maybe they went uh, a little way out in terms of exterior styling. It's kind of an, an odd-looking vehicle. It, it gets attention when you see it, and I don't know that it's all necessarily good attention. I think they're probably toning it down for, for this edition, uh, kind of mainstreaming it some. Of course, these vehicles are fueled by hydrogen, and there's not a hydrogen station on every corner. Uh, no, there so, isn't. Yeah, so that makes it much more difficult. Uh, what the vehicle puts out uh, basically is water vapor is the only thing that uh, comes out of the fuel cell. So the only kind of emissions is is water vapor. Uh, very, very clean from that standpoint. And when I have driven Mirais in the past, and I've driven them several times, I, I kind of feel like I'm driving the future, but I think your analysis is spot on that it just hasn't gotten that much visibility. And, and some of it, I think, has to do with the fact that there's no infrastructure to support it across most of the country. So you could buy Absolutely. one and, and then not be able to drive it, essentially, or you, you'd, I, you'd be hard-pressed, for example— to drive it cross country. Yeah, that 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 would be kind of a, an important factor because it not not to drive across country but just to address the range issues which you know is still like the number 1 number 2 issue of consumers when it comes to electric vehicles. So, you know, a hydrogen vehicle they're going to have that same range anxiety like, "Oh my gosh, am I can I get to there and then to there and then back home?" Or, yeah. They're going to have it yeah. for a different reason, but you're absolutely right. You're going to have some range anxiety just because there aren't the the uh, filling stations. You know, you can find gasoline pretty much everywhere. Diesel is not so hard to find, but, uh, mm-hmm. you know, filling up with hydrogen is uh, quite a task. You are correct, sir. So we look forward to this, though. I look forward to the new generation of the Mirai, and, and my guess is it will be a, a much more conventional-looking vehicle with uh, a lot of uh, very conventional uh, interior creature comfort. So that's very cool. Here's a story, and it ha- has something to do with uh, J.D. Power, actually. Uh, although the headline is about General Motors, General Motors has just launched a use-based auto insurance uh, scheme. Scheme might have negative connotations, but it's uh, an action. Uh, using OnStar vehicle data. You, you want to talk a bit about this, Gino? You know, it's interesting because Tesla has has kind of come out and said something similar in the past about they want to get in, you know, they're in the auto insurance business as well. And I, and I think one of our, our uh, VP of our insurance practice at J.D. Power has talked about, you know, Tesla getting into this business for a simple reason. They have more information on their vehicles and control over the insurance processes. Yeah. And, you know, they, they've talked about... Um, you know, insurance rates from traditional carriers for Tesla are quite high due to the, due to the complexity and the specialized repair techniques. Yeah, and it's an you expensive know, vehicle. EVs. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, you know, we all know Tesla kind of operates in this closed ecosystem of distribution, parts, repair, and, you know, the complexity of their vehicle. They pretty much hold everything close to the vest. But, well, when they have more data on the car and the driver, it makes more sense to them to be able to offer a better insurance product, a cheaper insurance product to their owners. And they have, let's say, a better, um, a better analysis that they can, they can look at, at these cars and say, okay, what, 
you know, what are what kind of parts are going to break down? What do we have to be focused on? Where where are we at risk? Right. Well, and they also have telemetry on each car. They probably know more know more about where the driver has gone than the driver can remember, right? I mean, they right. have and, and see, chapter and see, verse on how fast and how far and where and all of that. That's right. So they can use, you know, their their methodology. The other uh, the other word that I'm thinking of in the insurance world, uh, you know, they analyze their risk. Right. What are they going to be at risk at? Right. Well, they have what the risks are. They have all that information and, and another insurer doesn't. So that's why that other insurer charges so much more money to kind of cover what may or may not happen with that Tesla. And Tesla's looking at it saying, well, we can offer a better price and guess what? It's still going to make us money. It's going to be another uh, income source. So if they can do it and, and have a better connection with their owner base, then great. And I think that's probably right. what GM is looking at doing. But, you know, here here's where it does get kind of tricky, too. And Kyle Schmidt, our, our insurance practice lead, says, you know, on the surface, yeah, this appears good, but there's a lot of hidden costs that influence the final rate that a customer sees. So he raises a question like, will OEMs distribute this through the dealership? Now, that's going to cost training, you know, training time, there's money going into that, the, the commissions they have, uh, the competition with other companies that may be already in the dealership and insurance distribution pipeline, like dealer policy. How are, how are claims going to be handled? You know, there, there's so much there. Absolutely. I think claims is a big one, right? I mean, most of the yeah. time, I think most of us have a, a very benign or just just fine relationship with our insurance company. But there are times when it can be contentious with an insurance company. And if in, the insurance sure. company is also the brand of the car you, you have just bought, uh, you know, you're probably going to turn off a lot of people to that brand if they're not having a good experience or, or even if they think they're being charged too much. Uh, yes. So I, I think it has a lot of ramifications. Uh, GM, kind of like Tesla, t GM is going to use OnStar because it has a lot of uh, OnStar-based telemetry on uh, what individuals are doing and where they're driving, where the typical insurance company is essentially guessing what the, what the driver is, is doing and where mm -hmm. they're going and whether they're safe or not. And they, they use a lot of clues to help them guess, but it's a guess. Whereas with this telemetry, uh, they're going to know much more clearly. Absolutely. And, and one last point, Jack, that I want to add is like, okay, if you get in a collision and you need to repair your car, well, customers legally have a choice in choosing their own repair facility. Now, are they with this GM insurance product, are they now going to be required, you know, to use a GM authorized repair facility only like a collision repair center that that, that the local dealership owns, regardless of price? You know, that's the, there, there's a lot of nuance here that, you know, I'm not an insurance expert. Um, I'm not a repair expert in any way, shape, or form, but I do know there are a myriad of issues that have to be addressed and who's going to be responsible and who's going to do the work and how will this be charged? How's the pricing going to be set? There's so many things that go into this and, you know, it's uh, uh, proceed cautiously would be my, yeah. would be my advice to consumers if this product comes out. Uh, be very aware of what it is you're signing up for. Right. Well, you're really signing up for the insurance company, be it uh, you know General Motors Associated, or there are some insurance companies, some traditional insurance companies, that will put a device on your car and then track you. That <laughs> that is a double-edged sword. It uh, is. Yes, so indeed. So you're in, inviting somebody into into your private uh, dealings, and uh, you can do with that what you will. So. <laughs> I think it, good advice is, is tread lightly. So when we come back, we're going to be looking at the uh, all-new 2021 Ford F-150 pickup. I was one of the uh, rare journalists who got a chance to drive it, and uh, we're just now able to talk about that drive. Uh, so I will talk about that in the next segment. And Gino of uh, J.D. Power, Gino Effler of J.D. Power, is going to have uh, some voice of the customer views about the whole full-size pickup truck segment including the F-150, so stay with us for that. With Gino Effler, this is Jack Nerad with you, and thanks so much for being with us 
on America on the Road. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody, to America on the Road. This is Jack Red with you. And along with me is guest host Gino Effler of J.D. Power. He is the uh, director of public relations at uh, J.D. Power, director of communications, I guess, is the proper term. Is that correct, Gino? Yeah, corporate communications. That's it. Yeah, all of those things. So uh, 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 a grand title for a grand guy. I should oh, mention, you. yes, I should mention that Chris Teague, who is our co-host, it can't be with us because uh, there's a little illness in his family, happily not COVID-related, but a little illness in his family. So I expect him to be with us uh, again next week, and we wish him well. And uh, we're very blessed to have uh, Gino Effler with us. We're going to be talking in this segment about uh, the all-new Ford F-150 pickup truck. I had a chance to drive it, uh, one of the few that got an early look at this vehicle, and it was very exciting to drive the vehicle. And so I'm going to dive right in. This is a vehicle that has not been driven by very many. And uh, among the other things I got a chance to test was the new 3.5 liter power boost full hybrid system uh, that is essentially the top of the line engine choice in the F-150. And it's a revelation. It really is. It's, it's pretty amazing. It offers uh, not only 415 horsepower and very, very strong fuel economy, uh, but it offers kind of diesel-like range, 700 miles on a single tank of gas. Wow. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that in and of itself. I mean, you're going to the gas station about half as, half as much, and I think that's a, a consumer benefit. Don't you think so, Gino? Oh, that's huge. I mean, g- yikes. 700 miles, that's, uh, that's, that's pretty phenomenal. Yeah, it, instead of going to the gas station every week, every other week or whatever, even if it's you know the time you save, that's pretty impressive. And yeah. how does that engine sound? Does it sound good? It sounds really good. And uh, you know, my, you might think, uh, being uninitiated, not having driven it, it's a hybrid engine. Maybe it suffers with power. Maybe it, uh, you know, isn't all it should be. Otherwise, you're giving up a lot for this fuel economy and range. But quite the contrary, it is. I think the most drivable of all the engines, and I got a chance to sample several of them during the the, the drive days. Uh, a lot of torque, and that torque from the electric motor is available essentially instantly when you need it. And that's what's the big revelation about this power boost technology is you get great fuel economy, but you also get great drivability. I would say the most drivable of all these and really good all around. And I would also say, too, you don't have to get the top of the line Ford F-150 to get a great truck. While I did love the power boost uh, powered vehicles, there are other vehicles in the line that are very, very good. I um, went out of my way to drive some vehicles that are essentially uh, the bulk of the volume, uh, SXTs and, and those kinds of vehicles, and they're really, really good. But um, beyond that, you know, the power boost is, is even beyond that in terms of uh, the drivability. And I would say, Almost no, there's no lag when you want power. It's right there. Mm-hmm. And I think that's because the uh, electric power, which is essentially free, it's captured by regenerative braking. Uh, right. Just there it is. That sounds awesome. Yeah. Very, very cool. Uh, they have they have done a lot of things with this truck. Of course, the Ford F-150 is um, the major totem, right? I mean, it is, it is the... Uh, giant uh, volume play for Ford Motor Company. It, it alone is a ma- It would be a major corporation if if F one hundred and fifty were a corporation all on its own, for example. Uh, so they spend a lot of time on it. They care a whole bunch about it, and it delivers great towing, great payload, um, and it has uh, new technology. Sync four is its latest infotainment technology, which works quite well. They I'd say two or three generations ago, Sync was pretty problematic. And I, I, I bet mm-hmm. the, the J.D. Power uh, information about the vehicles <laughs> would have pointed that out, you know, several years ago. But I think they've sorted that out. Sync 4 uh, operates very, very well. I wouldn't say it's exactly my favorite among all the infotainment systems, but it's very intuitive. You, I don't think people are going to trip over it. Uh, and so it's, it's brought... Ford certainly into the big leagues in in terms of infotainment, and that's such mm-hmm. a big deal these days. I mean, 
Oh, a huge uh, deal. Yeah, talk a bit huge about deal. that in terms of customer satisfaction and, and oh. you know how people feel about their vehicles. Well, the infotainment area in, in, in a lot of our studies, especially the uh, J.D. Power Appeal Study, which is kind of talking about the things you like, and then the uh, IQS, the initial quality study, talking about the things that you don't like or that go wrong or that you have problems with. Uh, infotainment is something that owners really want. They value it, uh, but it also is the primary source of problems. Uh, very simply, um, voice recognition continues to be the biggest challenge uh, that these uh, OEM systems face. You know, uh, call Jack Nerad. What? Call Jim Ma Mahoney? like what no no and you know the the frustration that consumers have with those systems it still shows up but they're they're getting better um not as fast as i think most consumers would like them to get better uh but i i think you know when i when i look at the ford f-150 which you said is the, the iconic uh ford model the truck that has been my god how many generations they've been making the Ford F-150. You know, it's always a strong, they always make great uh, new additions to, to that model with each generation. And the value of that car, it, or, or that truck, it, it always stays high. They, they retain great value. Uh, in the initial quality study this year, in 2020, um, the Ford F-150 finished third in the light and the large light duty pickup truck category behind the Tundra and the GMC, uh, GMC Sierra. But then in the, this year's vehicle dependability study, Jack, which measures um, reliability after three years of ownership, the Ford F-150 ranked highest in a tie uh, in the large light duty pickup truck segment. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's a vehicle that historically satisfies its owners, uh, they like the features, they like the fuel economy, they like so many things about it, and uh, it's reliable. And, and it sounds like the this new F-150 is, is going to continue that streak of greatness. Yeah, I, I think absolutely, and, and I think improve upon it. One area in which the F-150 maybe lagged, say the Ram 1500, uh, was in the interior. And they have provided an all-new interior uh, that is much higher grade. I'm not sure if it's exactly, in, in some grades, the equal of the top grades in the uh, Ram 1500, but it's, it's darn close to it, and I think it's in the eye of the beholder. And they have some really interesting things. They have done a thing where, um, in some of their trucks, they have gone uh, to a um, console-mounted shifter. It's kind of a typical shifter. But then that shifter folds away and you can fold out essentially a pretty big table <laughs> between you and the passenger seat in the front uh, to do writing. I mean, a lot of contractors are going to do uh, invoicing on there or, or take notes or, you know, they're going to eat their lunch or a, a, a billion different yes, things. Share some, share some charcuterie. Yeah, perhaps? exactly. With their, their <laughs> clients, uh, you know, that kind of thing. I, a little cold cuts as we, we call them cold cuts and cheese is what uh -huh. I love. But, uh, I, they've done a really good job on the interiors. And I would say again, not just the interior on the highest line truck, but the interiors in the more volume vehicles are also really good. They've also done some interesting things, uh, with the tailgate. Uh, there's essentially tailgate wars in the full size pickup truck realm. And they've put together a works surface on the tailgate that has, uh, mm. you know, like a yardstick, other measuring tools. You can, uh, it's got a little, uh, areas so you can clamp uh, wood down to, uh, you know, cut wood, uh, saw wood. Um, does a lot of interesting things. Just it's like a workbench. Yeah, essentially can act like a workbench, and a lot of people are doing that. And then to further that, uh, the hybrid vehicles in particular have this pro power on board uh, that works as a generator. So it, uh, you don't have to carry along a freestanding generator or buy one for that matter. Uh, it, in the, the biggest form or the most powerful form, it gives enough power to, uh, operate 28 average refrigerators. 
you can kind of power an entire uh, job site with it right there in the uh, in the bed of your truck. So uh, you know a lot of a lot of smart things going on. Wow. I think with the, with this uh, Ford F one fifty. It is an impressive vehicle, and I'm just scratching the surface. Uh, I also did some interviews while I was uh, on this event, and uh, we will bring you an interview with a, uh, a product expert on uh, Ford F-150 in an upcoming show, so look for that. And uh, when we come back, we have a real treat for you. We're not going to do, and the treat is not that we're not going to do listener questions because we love your listener questions, but I did a lengthy interview with a uh, just a terrific um auto journalist and writer, a guy named Ted West, a guy I've admired for a long, long time, and, and I think a lot of uh, writers in the car industry have admired Ted. He has a new book out called Closing Speed, and we will be discussing that with him. It's about a racing series he covered, a very dramatic racing series he covered many, many years ago. Uh, the book is new, Closing Speed, so we're going to be talking with Ted West. And uh, with Gino Effler, this is Jack Nerad with you on America on the Road. Thanks so much for being with us. Welcome back, everybody, to America on the Road. Jack Nerad back with you. I am proud and happy to give our listeners a treat. I guarantee this will be a treat. It's going to be a treat for me. We're going to be speaking with Ted West, uh, one of the... uh, Best auto writers of all time, the guy who inspired my career in auto writing. Uh, I could only hope to be a, as talented as Ted. And uh, so I, I'd love to speak to him, uh, and I'd love you to hear what he has to say. Uh, Ted and I have uh, known each other now for quite some time, and it's an interesting story, but I'll let uh, Ted tell part of it. Ted, first of all, thanks so much for being with us. I, I really do appreciate it. Well, thank you for the kind, kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to be with my good friend and talented writer, Jack Nerad. So there. <laughs> well, that's that's very nice of you to say, Ted, <laughs> and, and very unnecessary. Uh, but it, it is absolutely true that you did inspire uh, me to go into car writing, uh, for good or ill. <laughs> Maybe I have you to blame for this. Uh, oh, but uh, my apologies. you're something like a decade older than me, and when you were something like in your mid-20s, you started writing for Road and Track. And why don't you tell that story, and then I can tell how, how it affected me, <laughs> both uh, good and bad. Okay. Okay. Well, what actually happened was I I was going to University of California at Santa Barbara, and I was an English major. And it was my senior year at University of California, Santa Barbara. And between days surfing, I picked up a copy of Road and Track, and I read the great, the timeless Henry N. Manny III, who is certainly the most unusual and brilliant writer about racing that I've ever read. He was just extraordinary. And I read his stuff and it was so funny and so crisp and original. And I was reading it and laughing at it and thinking, God, if you can write this way about racing, well, hell, maybe I'd like to do that too. Uh, Maybe about racing, maybe about cars, but uh, I, I've always liked cars, but I had never thought that writing about cars could be that creative and that individual. But Henry Ann Manny III pulled it off. So I continued reading reading Road and Track for a couple of years, and then now it was my senior year, and I got this idea for a satire on uh, one of Road and Track's regular features uh, about, they called it their salon, where they would celebrate some incredibly expensive classic sports car and how wonderful and hallowed everything was to do with it. And I thought I'd do a satire using my uh, college student senior year 1948 Chrysler Windsor sedan, uh, which was, it was a pretty nice one, actually. It wasn't a bad one, but it was old. And It was old even then, was, and uh, that was, like was quite a while ago, it, right? That's right. It was old and rightly sneered at by anybody that really liked cars because it was big and heavy and fat in the front, and it just it was a ridiculous car in a lot of ways. But on the other hand, it was actually a pretty dependable car. So I thought... Well, I'll do a, uh, a satire and just 
write it and send it to James T. Crow, who was the editor at Road and Track, and I'll just, as they say in the business, send it over the transom, unannounced, and say, what do you think of this? I just think this would be fun to to run in Road and Track. And I said it and waited, and there was a long silence. And then I got a letter back saying, yeah, we like this. We'll print this. This is very funny, and this is very good. And uh, I can't tell you what it feels like to be a senior in college getting a story published in Road and Track, but if I can remember it correctly, it was worth a beer or two. Uh, it was right. really a wonderful experience. I'll bet it was. I'll bet it and was. It, it was amazing, yeah. And so I felt like I had uh, the right to propose a couple more stories, and I had one more published uh, just about 10 minutes after graduating from uh, college, and uh, so the next thing to do was to say to James T. Crow, Jim Crow, well, uh, here I'm this new kid out of college, but I need a job. Do you have anything? And he kind of swallowed deeply and he said, well, frankly, no, I don't have a damn thing. And uh, I said, well, that's a shame. And I didn't hear anything more, didn't do much more. And then I got a, a phone call from Jim Crow and he said, well, I still don't have a job at Road and Track, but I did the next best thing I could think of. I got you a job at Sports Car Graphic, which was a competing. Yeah, exactly. He got track. you a job at a competitor, and <laughs> which was uh, quite a, an odd thing to do, uh, you know, to uh, send a, a really good writer to a competitor. But that shows you what kind of guy he was, and uh, also I think it tells you a lot about how he felt about your talent, Ted. Or maybe it was the best thing he could do to damage the competition. I don't know, <laughs> but <laughs> there's another way to look he, at it. Isn't he it? got. Yeah, it's a, it, you know, send a torpedo into the sports car graphic deal. So anyway, he, he got me that job, and and I started there, and I was I started as feature editor, and I did monthly columns and road tests and went off to Can Am races, and I just had a hell of a time, right. and I, I just took off from there. So that's that's how I got started. Well, I mean, the, and the funny the, the funny thing too, Ted, is uh, that first story about the Chrysler Windsor uh, that you essentially sent over the transom to Road and Track. I remember quite well, and it really kind of inspired <laughs> me. And you know, I'm I was you know early teens at the time, I think, and I thought, wow, this is really funny. And what was amazing to me really was how funny it was, and it was in Road and Track, which wasn't necessarily noted for the funny. Uh, was yeah, noted for yeah. you know good stuff, but not necessarily the funny. Uh, so I, I enjoyed that. I, I noted your byline, and then I started to to follow you and followed you to uh, Sports Car Car Graphic, and uh, kind of followed your career ever since. Well, I'm glad you saw that first story because I enjoyed doing that story. That was a good time, and it got me off to a good start. And then I. Uh, was at uh, Sports Car Graphic for a couple of years, and then the same James T. Crow said um, at a uh, Trans Am race in the spring of 1970 at Riverside, he pulled me aside and said, hey, um, how would you like to go to Europe and cover the Porsche 917s for all of the uh, European races in the World Manufacturers Championship? And I said, what? <laughs> And he said, yeah, this spring, uh, you'd have to leave pretty quick. And uh, I said, well, uh, yeah, I would, and I'll do it. And I resigned from Sports Car Graphic to take up being a freelance automotive writer. And I got on a charter flight to Europe, and that set me off into the world, the, the, the world of world championship racing. And probably the most unforgettable two years of my life being in Europe each spring covering the Porsche 917s and the Ferrari 512s, which for my money are the greatest competitions 
in sports car racing since the war. They were just right. extraordinary. Well, and which brings us to the subject of your book. And the, the book is one of the reasons to speak to you, not just because uh, we love your writing, which we do, uh, but the fact that you've written a book called Closing Speed that really chronicles that and, and brings it uh, very vividly to life. And the the life and death, and, and there was plenty of death uh, in auto racing at that time, uh, is, yes, there is, was. is so dramatic. So, you know, kind of set the stage for our listeners about what the book is about, and uh, then I've got some questions for you about it. Sure. Well, first of all, uh, I didn't write the book until about 30 years later, but I had continued to think about Porsche 917s and Ferrari 5, 512s for years afterwards. That was even after going to covering the Indy 500 and going to the Le Mans 24 hours many years afterwards. And I kept going and I kept seeing professional racing and it was all wonderful and fast and dangerous and exciting, but nothing ever quite outdid the Porsche 917s and the Ferrari 512s. It kept staying in my mind. Is that because uh, of the machines themselves or the relationships you developed with the drivers or, you know, what made it so vivid to you? Both. Um, It was certainly the machines themselves. I mean, after all, let's, let's be reasonable here. This is the year 1970. And Vic Elford's Porsche 917 long tail went 248 miles an hour down the Mulsanne Strait at Le Mans in 1970. I mean, it was so much faster than anybody had ever gone in a racing car by 20% than ever before. The 512s and the 917s were so much faster. They destroyed lap records everywhere they went. In three or four cases, they destroyed the Formula One records of the same year. They were so much faster. They were these wonderful five-liter engines, pure racing engines, incredibly good aerodynamics, and they were just unbelievably fast. But it's still 1970. They are built for speed. They're not built for safety. None of the safety regulations were around that are there today. So they were dangerous as hell. And uh, in 1970, and then again in 1971, I was over there getting to know the people. I have lifelong friends from those days. Brian Redman is a dear friend of mine and has been since I got to know him well during uh, 1970 in Europe. He was one of the uh, Porsche fa- uh, factory drivers of 917s. He and Joseph Siffert, and uh, I, I had gotten to know Mario Andretti a couple of years earlier, but I followed him in, uh, he would drove Ferraris at uh, Sebring and Daytona. Uh, I mean, I, I have friends from those years that are still dear friends to this day. So it was the people too, but if you combine extreme speed and dangerous cars that were, I mean, you don't want to crash a Porsche 917 at 200 miles an hour. You just don't want to do it. Yeah, absolutely. And you combine true. that, right? You know, because I mean, the, the fact is, if you crash a Porsche 917, its weakest point is the cockpit. It breaks in half. And they had one do that in testing. They didn't kill the driver, Kurt Ahrens, but it very nearly could have. It just broke in half. That's what they do. Well, I think that's what's so vis- vivid about Closing Speed, your book, Ted, is you bring to life the machines, but you really bring to life the people who are driving them, and the people associated with them. It is absolutely a behind-the-scenes look at this type of racing, which is the most dangerous racing maybe ever, uh, and and arguably the most um, dramatic racing ever. Talk a bit about that, which, uh, you know, the, the this is a work sure. of fiction, but it, it obviously is drawn from personal knowledge. Sure. S- sort well, that out for me. First of all, I was... 27 in 1970. That tells you how old I am now. I was 27. I was a young kid going over there to wander around amongst these giants, these kings of the sport. And 
the, the other part about that is they were my age. They were about the same age. They were young guys. And I got to know them because we had things in common. And I got to know who they dated or I knew their wives. I got to know a lot of them and their wives. And I knew what their relationships were like. I mean, if you can imagine being just imagine just for a second, imagine yourself being the girlfriend of a guy who goes out and races a car at 248 miles an hour down the Mulsanne Strait. I mean, you're going to be scared to death half of the time that the guy isn't going to come back alive. And at that same time in formula one, there were driver after driver, after driver, these great drivers, drivers who I knew at the time were incredibly skilled and likely to protect themselves in a racing car. And yet time and time and time again, they were killed. People like Bruce McLaren and Mark Donahue and uh, just uh, Jochen Rint and brilliant drivers. And you would think, well, some drivers will get killed, but certainly not Bruce McLaren. Bruce McLaren is way too conscientious to let that happen. And it happened. And it happened over and over. In, in 1968, the first year I was at Sports Car Graphic, there was a period of four months where it was the third weekend of each month from May to June to July to August where <clears throat> we came to work on Monday morning and found out who had gotten killed that weekend. It happened every, every weekend on the, fourth, uh, the third weekend of four months in a row. Yeah. And it was just commonplace. It was just one of the things that you expected. And the reason I mention that is uh, there was nothing wonderful about that. I wasn't glad people were being killed, but it made the sport into something more than what it is now. And I'm not saying I wish it was that way again. I'm glad it isn't. But what it was, was, yes, a race in which we hoped somebody won, and that was exciting because that's what we still do now. We're excited by people who win races. But there was another level entirely. It was a big, big event. Right, because right. while it was a sport where somebody might win the race, the subject was life and death. And it was there all the time. And yeah, it was on the table at all time. Why don't you give our listener a little taste of uh, the plot in Closing Speed? With you know, sure. sir, you know, the narrator is a guy a lot like you, <laughs> I think. Yeah. Uh, but but take us through that, and and you know, some of the major characters and, and kind of how it unfolds. Sure. Well, loosely speaking, it's autobiographical, but very loosely speaking, because it's a work of fiction. The people in the novel are not real people, and they're not supposed to look like real people, so don't think that they are. But anyway, um, I went over as this young guy, um, young, relatively inexperienced uh, American auto, uh, racing journalist amongst all these European seasoned racing journalists, and they all thought I was kind of unusual because they aren't, weren't used to Americans coming over to cover racing. And I began to be around all the people at, at uh, uh, Gulf, uh, the 917's Gulf, John Wire, and I got to know John Horseman and John Wire and uh, David York and all the people in the team, and I got to know uh, Joe Sifford and Brian Redman and uh, Pedro Rodriguez and Leo Canunan and all of those guys, <clears throat> and I got to know Jackie Ix, who drove for Ferrari, and what happened was, as I got to know them, I got to know them better, and I began to care about them because I knew them. And the more I cared about them, the more nervous making the racing became. Became, and I wasn't, you know, I wasn't married to any of them. I wasn't. It wasn't like that. But it made me think, if it if it's unnerving to me, just kind of knowing them on a social level to be around these guys who could be snuffed any minute now, how must it be for the people close to them? And that made me think more about their women, for instance. And in the book, the book is about the drivers and the racing. Very definitely. It's a lot about the racing, a lot about the technical stuff and about 
the book follows exactly the way the races actually did unfold, although the fictional characters are different people than who were in the original races. But as uh, it made me think more and more about how the wives and the girlfriends must feel during this three and a half month period of time that I was in Europe. And the deeper into it I got, the more I thought about them and how they were living. And that is a large part of the, the novel, too. Right. Well, and and the character that is, you know, essentially based on you uh, eventually at least uh, falls in love or at least <laughs> very serious like uh, with one of those women. And, you know, that's a, a major part of the, the drama that ensues and because she's not exactly unattached. Right. 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 Well, now that's where fiction comes in. That didn't happen to me. I, this is a story of fiction. And that's what happens in the novel. Um, but the, the guy becomes so completely involved. And then there's a whole plot of characteristics between drivers and their wives, where they a relationship blows apart and a woman is almost abandoned by the the disaster in their relationship and the writer character comes to her aid and they become a couple and then terrible things happen in the racing. It's a, it's a very dramatic story. It's not exactly what happened, but in, in history, I'm saying it's not exactly what happened, but it's very close to some things that did happen. Uh, I wrote a fictional story but it's drawn from the kind of people I knew and the kinds of things that happened in their lives. It was a very, very dramatic time, and they lived dramatic lives, and, and I just don't envy them the lives that they had to live because a number of them, these wonderful, beautiful women who were uh, widows at age 26, 27, 28, widows of husbands they loved, and they were gone. Bang. It was the end of that. You know, it's very, very tough time. Well, and it sounds like, uh, well, certainly in the novel, the the narrator is very deeply affected by that. And, you know, the Absolutely. novel is, is set uh, more in present day, or where parts of it are set in present day, and then it's uh, a flashback to all of the racing. And uh, that's part of the drama, too. I mean, did it did it affect you as a journalist in the same way that it, it seemed to affect uh, that character? Well, it certainly had an impact on me. And, and that continued when I came and see, I, I would go over to Europe in the spring and cover the nine seventeens and the five twelves. And then I come back and cover the Can-Am and um, in the summer and the fall in the States, and then go back over to Europe in the spring and do that again. Um, and so I was around racing all year round and it was, you know, I was so lucky. It's just, I can't believe it. Even looking back on it, I was around the best kind of racing in the world all year round. I, in, in the summer and the fall, I was at the formula one races that were here. And so I was amongst the same people, a lot of the same drivers that drove the Porsches and the Ferraris in the world manufacturers championship were also formula one drivers. So I already knew these guys from being over in Europe in the spring and they would come over for the Formula One races in Canada and in, in the United States and Mexico with their girlfriends or their wives. And I would see how things were with them all over again. Um, and so I would see over a long period of time how relationships were affected from the stresses of all this stuff. And sure, it, it affected me. I saw what they were going through. It was a very uh, sobering sort of thing to see the perspective of how they lived their lives. Uh, I don't envy them. Uh, they were living lives that are just a lot bigger than most of us could stand. What is your assessment of them? I mean, these were obviously very courageous guys, guys that were very brave because literally death was around every corner. But at the same time, they, they seem to be able to put that out of their minds or think that, you know, it was going to happen to somebody else, but it wasn't going to happen to them. Is your assessment that that, what's your assessment of them? I, I, I always am of multiple minds about somebody who 
uh, puts themselves through that? Well, <clears throat> one way to think of them is they're like fighter plane pilots in World War II. They, they were aces. They were really, really good at what they did, and they accepted what they did, and they knew that their buddy didn't come back yesterday, but that was their buddy. It's not them. It's not going to happen to me. I'm good. I know how to do it. And they could do that. And, and they just didn't think about it a lot. Uh, and there's a very important thing to keep in mind about racing in the 50s and 60s and into the 70s. It was much closer to World War II. And in World War II, especially in Europe, people were used to the idea of sudden death. There was so much death that people were still used to the idea that, well, somebody got killed. Well, well, we're not used to that at all now. To now and now it's, it's just taboo. If somebody gets killed, everyone feels ashamed, like, oh, my God, that is just completely unnatural. Back then, our culture was just beginning to move away from the constant reminder of people getting killed. And racers were part of that re- remainder of, of, of that culture. And they themselves were just like people in the war. They thought of themselves that way. They just gritted their teeth. They didn't think about it. They just did what they do. And um, <clears throat> I don't know how they did it. I mean, I've been in uh, race cars, and I don't think anything's going to happen to me, but I never did anything anywhere near as dangerous as often as those guys did. So I don't know how they did it, but they just did. It was, it was their nature. That is who they were. They, uh, they recognized themselves and defined themselves as people who do that. Yeah, and I think they have to put out of their mind the fact that uh, mortality is out there, right? I mean, when I'm, I, I'm not a particularly Absolutely. good race car driver. I, I've driven on a few tracks and, and taken some instruction and uh, enough to learn that I'm, I'm not all that great at it. But I also, I think part of it is I, I realize the danger, and I don't necessarily want to accept all that. And uh, sure. you know, the danger is much less than there, um, there was then, where, you know, you could do everything right and still end up dead before the afternoon was over. I mean, there's no doubt about it, right? But there's another side to it, and it's in the book, too. There is nothing that feels better than nailing a corner and then nailing the next corner and then nailing all of the corners of an entire track and doing a perfect lap and then doing it again and then doing it again and again and again. And the drivers I knew, like people like Denny Holm or or Dan Gurney or guys like that, when they did it right, they just lit up. They knew how good they were. They knew nobody else could do it better than them. And it filled them with a kind of a pride and excitement that is not replaceable in normal lives. You can't get that anywhere else. And in, in to a far, far lesser degree, when I've done something right in a car on a racetrack, I know what that feels like. And it makes me think, Oh, I want to go do that again. And if I were just a little bit more, into that mode, I would be a race car driver who would do it again and again and again and again until, whoop, it's over. And that's what those guys were like. Well, and, and it's kind of interesting, Ted, because there's a couple things in my life that where I've ha- had that same kind of feeling. And, and one is hitting a baseball and hitting it square and, and you know, hitting yep. it hard. You know, you, you turn around an 85 mile an hour fastball and that feels pretty good. Uh, in fact, it feels really damn good. Uh, yep. The other thing is is doing stand up comedy, and when it works, uh, and it often doesn't, but when it works, that's a pretty cool feeling. And yep. I can see why people would want to repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. I mean, it's kind of an endorphin rush, right? And I think uh, some people get it from driving race cars, and some people get it from uh, getting up in front of an audience and trying to make them laugh. And uh, Absolutely. You know, you and I do do it a bit by you know trying to write stuff that uh, people love, and then they tell us that uh, they like them. Uh, that's kind yep. of cool too. That's a little yep. bit of a rush too. But people really are attracted by somebody who does it in a race car. I mean, people idolize somebody who does that at a very very high level in a race car, and that is part of the, the equation too. I mean, the guy knows he does it. 
but then he recognizes everyone else knows he does it. It's a very addictive thing. Yeah, there's an animal attraction that you know crosses genders, right? I mean, Absolutely. guys think the guy is really cool, and women think the guy is really cool. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's very special because way, way in the background now, but much closer in the background, that's a guy who is not afraid of death. He is afraid of nothing. He will go and do what he does best, even though it's a terrible risk. And people go, wow, that's an amazing guy. Right. Well, the name of the book is Closing Speed. Uh, it's from E.M. Lancey Publishers, uh, LLC. Uh, Ted West is the author. It's available on Amazon. It's available uh, various places uh, around the web and in, in a lot of Barnes and Noble, for example. It's just a terrific book. I think it's uh, just so takes you inside something that uh, is really fun and really interesting to get inside. And I think although it's about racing, I think people who don't care one whit about racing and ha have no idea what a, an endurance race even is would find this uh, to be a fascinating read. And, uh, you know, I, I, I thank you for writing it, Ted. Well, thank you, Jack. Thanks for the kind words. I'm just glad I could write it because I had to get it off my back after 25 or 30 years. I just had to think, boy, there's nothing else I can write until I write this one because it's my sort of, uh, my sort of love song to professional racing, which has always been just my first love. And uh, I had to get it, I had to get it done, and I did. Well, I'm glad you did, and I we look forward to having you back on the show because I want you to share other stories about uh, the time you uh, times you covered racing, and you know all the all the famous and infamous drivers that you covered <laughs> through the years and, and knew and all that. So uh, you know we'll have to have you back on the show. But again, the book is uh, Closing Speed by Ted West, uh, available on Amazon and elsewhere, and uh, look for it and. Uh, Thanks so much for being with us, Ted. I, I really do appreciate it. Thanks, Jack. I'd love to come back. Thank you so much. I can talk about this forever. <laughs> <laughs> I think we both can, Ted. And uh, stay with us, everybody. We'll be right back, right here on America on the Road. And that was our interview with Ted West, one of the best auto writers of all time. Just a terrific guy. And uh, the book is Closing Speed. Closing speed about um, just, I think, the most dramatic racing series out there. And, and Ted captures it so beautifully. He's such a, a talented writer and, and great reporter. A terrific book, Closing Speed. Look for it from E.M. Lancey Publishers. And I certainly want to uh, thank Gino Effler for so ably co-hosting and guest hosting uh, on a moment's notice. Thanks so much for being with us, Gino. Jack, it's always a pleasure to be on America on the Road and uh, to have an audience. It, it's and you're a great, uh, a great host. And and you know what, Jack? You should come back next week, even if I don't. I think I might do that. And Gino, of course, okay. is the director of corporate communications at uh, JD Power. Look for things. Where where can people uh, learn about JD Power, Gino? Jack, they can go to jdpower.com to find out uh, about. That's our car shopping website. Right, and you'll see that. And I bet if you look hard enough, you'll find a picture of of Gino Effler there, too, and see his handsome uh, visage staring back at you. So look for that. And uh, again, thanks so much to Gino for being with us. And thanks to you, the listening audience, for being with us. You're the reason we do what we do here on America on the Road. So please join us again next week right here for America on the Road. I'm Jack Nerad. <music>